Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to your first flip lesson of the year for Coster's biology class. Um, you should have your characteristics of life notes organizer, and you should be filling it in as I talk through the PowerPoint. Okay, so biology is the study of life and living organisms. So then we ask ourselves this very philosophical question, what is life? Well, in terms of biology, that's actually a very easy question to answer because all living things have these similar characteristics. In this class, we're going to give you eight. Um, all living things are made up of one or more cells. All living things display organization. All living things grow and develop. All living things reproduce. All living things respond to stimuli. All living things require energy. All living things maintain homeostasis, and all living things adapt to their envi environment. If you're not done writing under number two on your notes organizer, you can press pause at any time. Before we talk about the characteristics of living things, I want to give you a vocabulary term, and that term is organism. An organism just means anything that has all of those eight characteristics or at one point did have all of those eight characteristics. Okay, so an organism is another word for a living thing or this word right here, a biotic factor. So number three is define organism. Number four, a biotic factor is a living thing and an abiotic factor is a non-living factor in an environment. So I'm going to go through each of those characteristics one by one and just talk more about them. So number one, all living things are made up of one or more cells. You're probably very familiar with that term cell. A cell is the basic unit or the building block of life. Now, some organisms exist only as one cell. We call those organisms unicellular. Other organisms are made up of many, many cells. We call those multicellular organisms. So an example of a unicellular organism would be like the strep bacteria that gives you that sore throat and makes you very sick. It exists as one single cell. Other organisms that are multicellular, that would be like plants and animals. We are multicellular. We don't exist as one cell. We're made up of many cells. Now, all cells contain genetic information. Most of the time we're talking about DNA, sometimes we're talking about RNA, but that genetic information is what carries the instructions for life. So this is all under number five on your notes organizer. All living things display organization. They are structured so that those individual pieces of an organism all have specific functions. Each organized structure in an organism has a specific function. Now, organisms are all structured in similar ways. We go from these small, tiny parts to, called atoms all the way to the individual organism itself. Okay, so I want you to fill in your triangle. I've given atoms there down at the bottom because we have more atoms than we do, you know, single organisms, so that's why organisms is going to be up at the top. So fill in your triangle, organisms, molecules, organelles, which are those tiny parts of cells like the mitochondria, the nucleus. Okay, then you have your individual cells. Cells come together to form tissues. Similar tissues are organized together to form organs. Okay, so that would be like your heart. And then similar organs work together to form an organ system. So that would be like your entire circulatory system. And then you have your organism, which is the um, individual living thing, which has all the characteristics of life. Okay, so all that is number six on your notes organizer. Okay, number seven, all living things grow and develop. Now, though we sort of use those terms interchangeably, but they actually do mean different things. Growth is simply an increase in mass or getting bigger, an organism getting bigger. Development is when the organism actually changes in its abilities, results in different abilities. Okay, so this, we have a tadpole here. Obviously, it's growing. It's getting bigger from birth when it's a very small tadpole, tadpole to when it's an adult bullfrog. And then, of course, it develops. It changes. Okay, it loses its tail. It grows the legs. It loses the gills. It grows the lungs, that sort of thing. So you have it growing bigger, but you also have it changing. That's development. So that's number seven on your notes organizer. Okay, number eight on your notes organizer, all living things are capable of reproduction. 
Now, reproduction is simply the production of offspring. You know what reproduction is. Organisms reproduce and pass along traits from one generation to the next. So the whole purpose of reproduction is not so that the organism can survive, because obviously organ every organism is going to die at some point, but so that the species as a whole can survive. So the purpose of reproduction is to ensure the survival of the species. Now, there are different ways that organisms can reproduce. They can reproduce asexually or they can reproduce sexually. And I'm just going to give you sort of the broad definition of asexual reproduction and sexual reproduction. Asexual reproduction is when you have one single parent producing an offspring. Now, because the, there's only one parent, those offspring are going to be genetically identical to the parent. Okay, so the offspring are genetically identical to the parent in asexual reproduction. So this would be like bacteria basically dividing, it's one single cell dividing in half um, after it goes through cell division and the offspring cells are going to be genetically identical to the origi original parent cell. You have plants that are capable of reproducing asexually and those offspring plants are going to be identical to the parent plants. Um, sexual reproduction is when you have two parents producing offspring. So two parents, this is sexual reproduction. So you are going to have genetic differences between the parents and the offspring. Of course, humans reproduce through sexual reproduction. Um, plants are also capable of reproducing through sexual reproduction. That's why they release all that pollen in the springtime. Okay, two parents, offspring are genetically different from the parent. So this is number eight on your notes organizer. You should be filling in that Venn diagram. Okay, number nine on your notes organizer. All living things respond to stimuli. Living things will make changes in response to their environment. So in the case of our little picture here, we have a window over here. Let's see if I can draw a window. You get the idea, which obviously has sunlight coming through it. What is that plant doing? That plant is growing towards the sunlight. It is responding to its environment. It is changing based on the environment. So the stimulus is anything that causes the reaction, anything that causes some sort of reaction in an organism. And the response is the reaction to that internal and external stimuli. So in the case of our picture here, what is causing the change? That's going to be the sunlight over here in our window, right? So that would be our stimulus. The response, what is the change that is occurring here? The response is going to be that growth of the plant towards it. So the stimulus is the sun, the sunlight. The response is the growth towards it. So in our notes organizer here, we have number nine, um, D. I jump out from behind a corner and you scream. In this scenario, what is the stimulus the thing that causes the reaction, and what is the response, the reaction? So the stimulus here is going to be what? Me jumping out from behind the corner, right? And then the response is going to be you screaming. Okay, number 10 on your notes organizer. All living things require energy. Energy is required for all of these life processes that are taking place inside every organism's body. Right, everything from photosynthesis to cellular respiration all the way to what we just talked about, growing and developing. Now there are different ways that organisms obtain energy, but we all get our energy from food. So there are different ways that we sort of get our food, right? Some organisms are capable of making their own food, other organisms have to find their food elsewhere. Okay, so I'm going to give you three terms, this is number 10 on your notes organizer, and I want you to define these terms and give an example. An autotroph is an organism that is capable of producing its own food. Capable of producing its own food. Think auto, they do it automatically. So this would be like plants. They produce their own food through the process of photosynthesis. They take energy from the, from the sun and use it to make food for the plant. So that is an autotroph. Heterotrophs are like us and other animals, and they obtain their food elsewhere. They have to get their food from another source. So that would be example humans or a little prairie dog here. Um, and then last are decomposers and they obtain their food by breaking down dead and decaying matter and then they sort of absorb the nutrients and that's what allows them to, to obtain energy. 
Okay, so that's autotrophs, heterotrophs, and decomposers. Number 11 on your notes organizer is all living things maintain homeostasis. That word homeostasis, it sounds scary, but really it just means that all living things are capable of maintaining a stable internal environment, a stable internal environment. And when you think about that in terms of humans, that makes sense. We know that our body is supposed to exist in certain conditions, right? Our body is supposed to maintain this stable internal environment of 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. So your body is capable of maintaining homeostasis, that stable internal environment. How, what is an example of how humans maintain that stable internal temperature? How do you make sure your body doesn't get too hot? What's something that you do? What is this guy doing right here? He's sweating. Okay, so we sweat to sort of cool our bodies off. Do you know what your body does automatically when you start getting too cold? It's something that you can't control. You shiver, right? These are processes that begin immediately in order to restore an organism to its normal state. So that is homeostasis. An organism like a fish that lives in salty water, they constantly have water going in and out of their bodies through osmosis um, to maintain that stable salt condition. Okay, number 12 on your notes organizer. All living things adapt to their environment. An adaptation is any inherited characteristic that results from changes to a species over time. In other words, it's a trait that an organism has that helps the species to survive. So if I asked you, you know, what is an adaptation that cheetahs have, you can tell me that a trait that they have that helps them to survive is their ability to run really fast. That is an adaptation. It makes them better suited for the environment that they live in. So 12B, an organism which is well adapted to its environment, is more likely to survive. And a strong species is going to be one that has a lot of genetic variations. Okay, think about plants. Um, if you're growing some sort of crop like corn and they are susceptible to some sort of disease, if that disease is introduced to your crop and they're all exactly the same, then they're all going to die. But if you have genetic variation and some of your crop is susceptible to it and some of it is not, then the species is more likely to survive. Okay, for number 13 on your notes organizer, I've given you a list of terms there. I want you to place them into the appropriate categories, either as biotic factors or abiotic factors. Biotic meaning living, abiotic meaning non-living. Think about, do they meet the eight characteristics of living organisms? If they do, then you should be placing them under the biotic factors. If they don't, they should go under the abiotic factors column. And we will go over that in class.